And this is Fintan Don reporting. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining us for this part one of our new series, 9-11 Without Tinfoil, presented by yours truly with research by Cathy McMahon, who may also be known to some of you as the Queen of Neem. And you can find out more about that at neemwell.com. That's N-E-E-M-W-E-L-L.com. And Cathy can advise you personally also. Just email her, K-A-T-H-Y, at neemwell.com. Cathy, of course, well known to regular listeners of the show, not so well known to new ones. And uh, I'd like to welcome new listeners because I have asked our regular listeners to circulate this audio widely. So, by way of introduction to new listeners, Cathy and I, either through Break for News or PsyopNews.com, have been on the story of 9 11 since about seven days after the event when we produced our first investigative report. And last year, in August of 2005, BreakforNews.com published a list of 108 websites either controlled or deeply influenced by the CIA. Yes, there was a bit of shock horror when we did that, but the intervening year since then has largely proved us right. Now, this series is subtitled A Guide for the Perplexed. And hey, don't feel you're alone on this. There's a lot of people perplexed because of the uh, what we've already outlined as the orgy of evidence which has been shoved at us by this array of CIA fake websites and uh, fake personalities. So uh, if you're new to 9-11 Conspiracy, please don't be put off by the vast amount of rubbish which has been placed on the internet over the last five years. What we will be doing here is taking a decidedly no tinfoil look at the evidence that 9-11 was some kind of an inside job. There is much evidence relating to 9-11 that is inconclusive, suspicious maybe, but nevertheless inconclusive. Instead, we'll concentrate on the hard evidence and we'll begin by putting it all in context. You see, especially if you are still not fully convinced about this issue, if you are suspicious but lack the essential tool set to prove it either to yourself or to others, well, you're in the right place because we're going to cut through an awful lot of BS and get right down to the brass tacks. As I say, we're going to place this in context. There's no point in getting into 9-11 unless we have a valid context. Let's just bracket what we're doing here just to define exactly what we're at. At no point am I saying that large numbers of persons involved in the US military or the US government or the US political structure deliberately, consciously participated in the planning and execution of 9-11. That is one of the biggest arguments which is placed forward by mainstream apologists to counteract conspiracy theories is that it would just involve too many people and you couldn't keep that a secret. And that's valid criticism. The conspiracy was not vast, it was small, contained, and operated with tens of people, not hundreds. Now, there are vastly more people involved in the cover-up than were involved operationally in the conspiracy itself. For example, the FBI, who spent an awful lot of the post-9-11 period going around confiscating all the vital evidence they could lay their hands on, arriving at the scene of the Pentagon within minutes to confiscate videotape in the area. Does that mean they were in on the 9-11 attacks, those FBI officers? No, of course not. It means that somebody told them to go and do that. And with the top-down operational control in the intelligence and security apparatus, it is possible for a small number of key individuals to participate in controlling organizations like the FBI, CIA, NSA and the military and ensuring that their actions dovetail with a very, very small group which orchestrated the actual attacks. So that's our framework. We're not talking vast conspiracy here. And so let's begin with the first and most important vital evidence in relation to 9-11. And it's the issue of democracy itself in the United States of America. Now, a democracy, as we all know, is a governmental institution where the politicians carry out the will of the people. Or should I say, where the people carry out the will of the politicians. And if you have noticed that kind of a problem over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, then you'll realise why I'm talking about the issue of democracy. You see, it's the issue of democracy itself that leads to the 9-11 event. And when you understand the context of US democracy, then the 9-11 event doesn't become a question of whether it was an inside job, but from the evidence we'll present to you, it's a question of how it could be other than an inside job. Let me list off for you the President's since the time your troubles started. John F. Kennedy, 1961-63, to 63, 
Lyndon Johnson, 63 to 69. Richard Nixon, 69 to 74. Gerald Ford, 74 to 77. Jimmy Carter, 77 to 81. Ronald Reagan, 81 to 89. George H.W. Bush, 89 to 93. William Jefferson Clinton, 93 to 2001 and 2001 to the present day. George W. Bush. But the trouble was already getting deep by the Carter administration. It's as far back as the Carter administration that the problems with Al-Qaeda begin. 9-11 and Al-Qaeda have their roots in the Carter presidency because that was when Brzezinski initiated the policy of activating these Muslim extremists, at first directing them against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, but over a period of years since the Carter administration, ploughing literally billions into Al-Qaeda, working with them in Yugoslavia, working with them in Macedonia, and working with them in Afghanistan, along with the Taliban, the US administration and the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, the ISI, channeling funds through to the Taliban and to Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Now, the Pakistani ISI working very closely with the US administration and the CIA. And the reason I'm stressing that about the Carter administration is because of the catastrophic impact of Ronald Reagan's election would tend to otherwise focus us on Ronald Reagan. And uh, before even getting into that, I just want to spotlight the fact that it started with Carter. So already you were in trouble with Carter because that's where your Al-Qaeda problems began. Remember that it started with a Democratic president and it continues today with a Republican president, George W. Bush. Now, it's good that he comes up because Bush inevitably does come up in relation to 9-11. And there's a Jedekis rap song which says Bush knocked down the towers, etc. And a lot of anger directed at George W. Bush as the cause of all of our problems. And uh, a lot of that is deliberate baiting, which is taking place. For example, with Bush's comment, like, it'd be a lot easier if uh, this was a dictatorship and if I was the dictator. You remember that one? Well, here's the real deal. George Bush is not the cause of our problems. George Bush is not the president of the United States. There hasn't been a president of the United States since Ronald Reagan. Since Ronald Reagan was elected in 1981, one person has ruled the United States of America as a dictatorship. That person is George H. W. Bush Sr. That person came to power in 1981, tried to eliminate Reagan so he could take over as soon as possible. Such was his impatience. This is a guy in the mode of Stalin. I'm talking about here. But but you're, you're saying to me, I mean, George H.W. Bush, he's retired. He's in the background. He doesn't really approve of some of the things that George Bush Jr. has done. Jr. has done nothing. Jr. has done what Jr. has been told to do. All of that stuff about George Sr. not approving of what Jr. is doing is just so much disinformation, misdirection. Recently, James Baker was over in Baghdad speaking with the token Sunnies who are part of the so-called democratic process in Iraq. He's still active. Baker Botts, the legal firm, was the firm which defended the Saudis who were being sued over 9-11, if you recall that. So these people haven't gone away. They are still there and they are running things. It's not coincidental that you have the former head of an intelligence agency running things in Russia, Vladimir Putin, and you have in the United States the former head of an intelligence service running things. George H. W. Bush Sr. is the dictator of the United States. And if you in any way buy that there is some kind of a presidential function ongoing in the Clinton presidency or in the Bush presidency, forget it. The president is now a nominal appointee of the George Bush Sr. dictatorship of the United States. And Bill Clinton's so happy to have been picked as the man that uh, he really enjoys those games of golf now with George Bush Sr. I mean, I bet you he even lets him win. So, um, you know, if it's disconcerting to you, I mean, you, you've come here for 9-11 stuff, the really hot stuff about 9-11, and here I am talking about the fact that you're living in a dictatorship akin to the Stalin era in Russia. We're going to get to 9-11. 
but you can forget even looking at it. There's no point in looking at 9-11. You will be taken for a ride unless you understand the true nature and reality of the plight into which the United States of America has fallen since George Bush Sr. became your dictator. He doesn't do it in your face. Well, he said, hey, welcome to the New World Order when he was elected. But then, this guy's not dumb. He knows how to take a back seat and he knows how to manage events from behind the scenes, just as he knew how to manage Ronald Reagan. It's no coincidence, for example, that you had Margaret Thatcher yesterday on the anniversary, the fifth anniversary of 9-11, linking arms with Dick Cheney and Lynn Cheney and placing wreaths as memorials to the victims. Margaret Thatcher, who had that famous special relationship and who was an enthusiastic supporter of the first Gulf War. That's another little hint for you, because the question has always been asked, why didn't George Bush Sr. go to Baghdad when he could have? Partly the answer is, of course, that Saddam Hussein is and always has been a CIA agent. But the other part of it was geopolitical. They didn't need to go all the way there at the time because they knew they were coming back. They knew that because the Clinton presidency was scheduled to run 93 to 2001 and Junior was scheduled to take over. And so the evidence for a conspiracy theory in relation to 9-11 is considerably strengthened by realizing that they knew they were going to be coming back to Iraq because they knew 9-11 was going to happen, because they were going to make 9-11 happen. The Al-Qaeda that Jimmy Carter started ends up being the excuse for why 9-11 happened. And the fact that the United States is back in Iraq right now indicates that the policies of George Bush Sr. are being completed at this time. And in the interim, not only have all U.S. presidents since Carter funded al-Qaeda, but William Jefferson Clinton kept Iraq on ice using the sanctions policy on the no-fly zones and the relentless aerial attacks, kept it on ice until such time as George Bush Sr. was ready to implement part two of his plan. That's the part that involved the deliberate, calculated, cold-blooded murder of almost 3,000 people in the United States. That's the context of 9-11. Now, George Bush does not rule like Stalin of old. You can't just declare yourself dictator, not in a modern democracy. But you can have de facto dictatorship while rotating a sequence of symbolic presidents as you maintain power yourself. And to get away with it? Well, these people have become experts at political soap opera. And that's what you had in the Clinton era. That's what you had with Monica Gate, political soap opera. Because they've got to compete for people's time. And it's like a reality TV show. If there isn't interesting action going on, nobody's going to tune in. So Monica Gate was to get your interest going. The O.J. Simpson trial was to get your interest going. Feed them on bread and circuses, they say, and that's exactly what they've done. So... If you are a democratic activist listening into this, you're welcome to the show. And, uh, of course, that's why Kerry lost the election, as you now know. We are, of course, dealing with what I've called before the one-party, two-party state. The United States is a one-party state divided into two parties. But the uh, big implication of, of all that, for let alone for democracy, but specifically for the 9-11 issue and how it was executed and covered up, is that a one-party state, it makes sure it controls all possible political opposition, either by wiping out political opposition, literally murdering political opposition, or by infiltrating, co-opting, funding, taking over political opposition. That's even better, actually, because then people think they have representation, whereas they actually have the same old dictatorship. <laughs> Now, how has such political control been exercised in the United States? Well, we have some idea from the investigations which were conducted that revealed COINTELPRO, a counterintelligence program. And the classic application of counterintelligence in COINTELPRO was its use against the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers were destroyed. Counterintelligence agents infiltrated the Black Panthers. They set different elements of the Panthers and others on the resistance in black consciousness. They set them against each other. They murdered. They lied. They faked documents. And they totally tore apart the Black Panthers. As they went on, they became more subtle. And although these COINTELPRO programs are supposedly over, they do continue and they're being used still today, these COINTELPRO elements, in order to smokescreen the 9-11 event itself. That's our context. 
let's take it into more recent times. And if your troubles began back with the assassination of John F. Kennedy and compounded desperately with the election of Reagan and tragically with the ascendancy of George H.W. Bush as head of the CIA, then it has to be said that your troubles began to enter their final phase in 1993. You see, this has been a funny kind of coup, a slow coup, no tanks rolling down the streets and edicts from a military dictatorship. Now that's a bit too in your face for a modern democracy. This has been a rolling coup, a slow, relentless elimination of democracy over a period of years. And in 1993, the precursor to the 9-11 event happened. On February the 26th, 1993, a bomb exploded in the basement of the World Trade Center. And two days later, on the 28th of February 1993, the siege of Waco began. Waco was all about using spectacular destruction of civilians in order to intimidate the civilian population. And the seeds of another spectacular were laid two days before the Waco siege began in that explosion in the basement of the World Trade Center. And it was also in 1993 that a young black rapper out of Oakland, California started up a new rap group might seem like a trivial event in a year which saw the World Trade Center bombed and the conflagration at Waco to focus on the lowly start of a new rap group. But there's good reason for focusing on Boots Riley, who is the son of Walter Riley, a legal counsel to one of the co-founders of the Black Panther movement. Walter Riley, in fact, funded his son's initial rap career and it sort of meandered along pretty much all the way through those eight years of the Clinton presidency. But it wasn't until George W. Bush Jr. took over in 2001 that Boots Riley would hit the national consciousness. In the days and weeks after 9-11, Boots Riley would become infamous as he stood poised in front of a pair of burning twin World Trade Center towers, an album cover of his latest album, Party Music, depicting him depressing the button on a guitar tuner adapted as a detonator, triggering explosions in the World Trade Center which exactly matched the positions which were struck by the planes. And so I suppose it's extraordinarily prophetic really that this young Marxist hothead with funding from his Black Panther linked father decided to name his new rap group The Coup. It ended up being pretty appropriate didn't it? And we'll cover how we got from there to here in just a moment. This is Q Unique and Psychological Warfare. You're on the next level on breakfornews.com. And you're very welcome back. You're on the next level on breakfornews.com. Now, in particular for our listeners in the United States, you might care to take a look at what's happened in the United Kingdom to see the final culmination of the rolling coup process. What they did in the United Kingdom was they gave people a very heavy dose of Margaret Thatcher for many years, and they made sure that people were heartily sick and tired of the policies of Margaret Thatcher, longing to see the back of her and the Conservative Party, so that they literally cheered and partied in the streets when Tony Blair took over. And now you see, in the United Kingdom, Blair is adopting policies which are indistinguishable from those of Margaret Thatcher, viz his support of the United States invasion of Iraq. And the people in the United Kingdom are wondering, where could they get any political representation that would actually represent them? They've got a notionally left-wing Labour government carrying out right-wing neoliberal capitalist imperial policies. So that's the nature of this rolling coup process. And, and now we'll see how the coup, the rap group, fits into all of that. See, ever since the defeat in Vietnam, ever since the civil resistance in the United States of America to the war in Vietnam, the US elite and military-industrial complex have been working slowly, relentlessly and doggedly to ensure that they never again lose an imperial war due to the resistance of the civilian population. And the first thing that George Bush Sr. did when he took over was to institute the re-entry of the United States into the global conflict arena safely and with the assistance of international allies and that was Gulf War I. Wasn't pushing the envelope too much and just dipping their toes, so to speak, in the imperial war pool. 
but they didn't go in. Of course, one of the reasons they didn't go in was because they would have gone in with international support and therefore wouldn't have been in control of the outcome in the same way they are now, with just the Anglo-American element involved in the current invasion. This is a full-blown invasion and occupation, permanent occupation, and so this is a serious war, and this is the war they have prepared for, determined, as I say, principally to ensure in the execution of this war they would not face the problem they faced the last time with civil resistance in the United States. Now, partly that's been achieved by keeping the troop numbers relatively low by using high technology depleted uranium and other munitions in order to achieve military goals with small forces. But the complement of that has been to make sure that they would keep the left wing in the box. They were going to make sure. It would never even remotely get to the stage of demonstrations, mass demonstrations in the streets, etc., etc., because they would keep particularly the young left-wing activists, psychologically in the box, using psychological warfare tactics against them from the get-go. They had developed these tactical psychological warfare techniques for use against external enemies. Unfortunately, in this case, the people of the United States happen to be the enemy. Certainly, the left-wing in the United States is a major enemy of such a right-wing move. So they moved sharply to the right with the 9-11 attacks in 2001, deploying psychological warfare tactics against the left to keep them contained as they did so. Now you'll notice I'm not wearing my tinfoil hat. This is political theory. You can go and talk to professors in political departments of universities about this kind of stuff, and this is what they have done. I'm saying that Iraq 2 is a continuation of Iraq 1, that George Bush Sr. is still in power. And I'm saying that it would be ludicrous to believe that these people just got lucky. The first Bush is in office and you have Iraq War 1 and the second comes into office and you have Iraq War 2 and that's just because they're lucky. I've laid the groundwork. If you accept that in fact there has been a slow rolling coup ever since Bush Sr. took over in the Reagan presidency in 81 and that the current campaign in Iraq is part of his policy. Therefore, 9-11 was the enabling event for the continuation of that policy, of that dictatorship, of that regime and therefore is necessarily an arranged event. And I'm making that argument to you on political analysis of the true nature of US politics without any tinfoil hat. Now, you may have to pause. Push the pause button on this, if you like, right now and pause and think back and say to yourself, God damn it, if this guy isn't right, we have been under one dictatorial control of George Bush Sr. ever since Reagan. My God, all that stuff on television is soap opera. This is a dictatorship. And then you can click the pause button again and continue. Because if it is and if Iraq 2 was a predetermined policy, even at the time of Iraq 1, predetermined, then 9-11 was necessarily an inside job. There are two groups in the United States that are very important to this group waging such a war in Iraq. And those groups are both young. On one side, there's a group of young people, idealistic, right-wing in inclination, and nationalistic in outlook. Those people, that's the cannon fodder. Those are the recruits for the armed forces. And on the other side, young people, idealistic, left-wingers, and they're the potential enemy if they ever get out of the box. And so strategically, it must be ensured that the left never gets traction. Now, psychological warfare is what these people are good at. And a classic example of that is the Oklahoma event, or Waco, and of course 9-11. What you're looking at here is psychological warfare delivered by television. Now, the techniques of psychological warfare have been studied, and you can research this on your own. But one of the core aspects of it is to use a surface veneer on some kind of an event, but a subsurface strong message. So, for example, the Waco siege was about Koresh and his use of illegal arms or his stockpiling of illegal arms, etc. And that was the veneer. But the underlying message was, in a horrific way, this is what happens if you go up against the federal government. Or, to use a different technique, the O.J. Simpson trial which on the surface was about a murder trial, but the psychological warfare component was that it was a divide-and-conquer gambit aimed at dividing white and black in the United States. And these are the kind of reasons why the appearance of an album cover from Boots Riley's group The Coup 
just after 9-11 absolutely tells you that 9-11 was an inside job with years of planning gone into it. It's telling you that itself. It's saying that to you and at the same time it's not saying it to you. In other words, it's largely affecting you subconsciously. And uh, you can get a look at some links that go with this audio and the full-size cover of that coup album by clicking on the image that goes with this audio uh, to get to a post in the Break for News forum. And there you'll see in full living colour Boots Riley with his finger on the detonator of a guitar tuner which has an aerial attached to it. It's a guitar tuner detonator and behind him are explosions in the upper floors of both of the Twin Towers. And just above that, in large black letters, is the word COUP. And just in case you're not fully getting the message, and if you care to explore the message further, if you look closely at the guitar tuner, it has the words COVERT LABS written on it. Now, a name like COVERT LABS is a, is a clear allusion to covert action, or in other words, intelligence services. One of the first things that came into anybody's mind, and especially those of a sceptical mind when it comes to government, when the 9-11 attacks took place was who pulled this off and was this the government? Let's face it, Americans are war-weary at this stage and quite cynical about the actions of their own government. And so a substantial number of people were already thinking along those lines, especially those of a left-wing inclination. And yet to face up to that would be an almost unthinkable horror to have to face into that fact if that was indeed the case. But that certainly was the kind of thing running across the back channels of people's minds just after 9-11. And so into that fertile ground comes this album cover, which is pitched at everybody as a, a wacky coincidence, pitched in that way and attacked, in fact, by right-wing radio hosts who uh, condemned the guy as some kind of an Al-Qaeda sympathizer, etc. I believe that also was a smokescreen. They were making sure if there was going to be a controversy about this album cover, it would be that kind of controversy. But uh, when that happened, when, when that album cover came to widespread public attention all over the world, in fact, a lot of people looked at it and, and they looked at the group and they realised this group had been around for eight years and was called the coup. And, and so there was a plausibility there. And yet at the same time, this thing was saying to you, there's been a coup. I mean, it's like almost in your face. There's the Twin Towers, there's the explosions, there's the word coup written over it. And yet again, people say to themselves, well, it, it, it has to be a coincidence, surely. Not realising that back in 1993, when Boots Riley formed the rap group The Coup, the attack on the World Trade Centre took place, the first one, the precursor event to what was happening at the time of the release of the album. So, at the same time, this thing has a surface plausibility that makes you dismiss it in your rational mind as a coincidence, while at the same time, the subliminal mind, which isn't a dummy, has picked up the implications of this album cover, and it, in the quietness of its own spaces at the back of your head, is screaming, coo, 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 there's been a coo. Now, had there been? Well, yes, <laughs> in a funny way, there had, of course. The rolling coo had rolled on one more level and they were moving the game on one more level. On a subterranean level, they were at the point where they were prepared to say to you, coup, or in other words, hey, we're taking over. This, this is our final takeover now. And yet at the same time, it's just an album cover. And yet, as a rap album targeting young people of a left-wing inclination, exactly the target population who might form the core of any potential resistance to the imminent campaign in Iraq, now, you could say, and some have said, in relation to the Coup album cover, this, it, it, it is just a coincidence. Well, just a moment. I would buy coincidence. No problem. I would have no problem with that entire album, exactly as it is, except the group happens to be called the Bay Rappers, or something benign like that. Or I could buy it even at a stretch, if it had those elements that we're talking about, and it had been released four years before 9-11. But what I will not buy, and what no intelligent person can buy, is that an album cover with such psychological operations, psychological warfare content, showing exactly the locations on the Twin Towers which were struck by the planes, should come out from a group named the Coup exactly at the time of 9-11. That's stretching coincidence too much. You can take a look at some more of the background of Boots Riley who, as I say, is the son of Walter Riley, a legal counsel to one of the co-founders of the Black Panther movement, 
Walter Riley is still active in politics, in left-wing politics, uh, spends time with the Barbara Boxer camp, and uh, he and his son are rooted in revolutionary left-wing politics and, and have been for all of both their lives, which places them in an arena of politics which is the most ever penetrated by counterintelligence agents ever seen on the planet. There has never been an infiltration of a political grouping to the extent that the Black Panthers were infiltrated and destroyed by counterintelligence agents. Such a nest of counterintelligence agents has never before been seen or since. And I think when you put that kind of background together with the album cover and the clear psychological implications of the album cover, then there is only one conclusion. And you can get more on Boots Riley and his father Walter Riley and their associates and background by clicking on the picture that goes with this audio to get to Cathy McMahon's research on all this, which is in the Break for News forum. Cathy's uncovered a great deal of information and uh, you'll get the full details there. And so here we stand. This is our context a context in which the United States is under a dictatorship since the ascendancy of Ronald Reagan, a context in which al-Qaeda began with Democratic president, funded by both Republican and Democratic, and then finally supposedly allegedly turns to strike the United States, providing a perfect pretext for an invasion of Iraq, supported in full measure by psychological operations tactics deployed against potential resistance in the civilian US population. On the surface, there's a Republican Party and a Democratic Party, and they both fight each other. Behind the surface, the differences are cosmetic, and the democracy is a dictatorship. On the surface, people look at a coincidental album cover, and it unnerves them subliminally. Beneath the surface, you look at it now, and maybe you're thinking, my God, they're pretty brazen, aren't they? Yes, they are. To look at that album cover back then and realise what it was saying was an awful lot to take on board it would have needed a catastrophic reassessment of what America was and what America had become. And most people weren't ready to do that. They counted on that. They counted on the denial state and they counted on the intimidation to work. And it did. This is no new wisdom. This is no tinfoil hat stuff. This is as old as the New Testament. This is as old as he who hath eyes, let him see. And he who hath ears, let him hear. But we've all got eyes and ears, haven't we? We all see and hear. Or do we? Do we merely see the surface? Now that we have set the context, we can begin to decode what actually happened on 9-11. This is the British group, the Daikinis, and they've got some new ideas. And the lyrics says it all, really. The lyrics speak of seeing and yet not seeing. Eyes are frozen, steely and broken, blind but open. Let's pick it up in just a moment. You're on the next level on breakfornews.com. And we'll be right back. And you're very welcome back. You're on the next level on breakfornews.com. And uh, here we are. And I haven't even discussed the size of the hole in the front fascia of the Pentagon or whether that's a reflection or a pod on the underside of the plane that hit the World Trade Center and all the rest of that kind of nonsense. Uh, Because we'll get to that in the context of CIA disinformation, but it doesn't form any part of conclusive evidence that 9-11 was an inside job. No. Instead of focusing on that rubbish being put out by the CIA itself, instead we're arguing from sound political analysis of the past, moving now into the 9-11 event itself and out the other side of it into the cover-up operation which followed it. We will get in the course of this series to a lot of the evidence in relation to 9-11, but we're not going to put the cart before the horse. First, we set the context and we establish clear issues that you can make a determination on yourself. And the first clear issue you have to make a determination on is if you look at that coup album cover and you say to yourself, God damn it, there's no way this is just a coincidence. Well, then you've got the proof that 9-11 was an inside job right in front of you there, showing premeditation going back at least eight years to that 93 attack on the World Trade Center and the creation of the group, the coup. That's it. Make your determination on that. That is a meaty, substantial issue that you can weigh and you can put the political context of that to others and see how it strikes them. And we're not finished with the issue of psychological operations because even as that was going down, let me quote you from this report from ABC News five days after 9-11. The FBI has been conducting a block-by-block grid search through devastated lower Manhattan looking for the voice and flight data recorders of the two aircraft flown into the Twin Towers. Investigators discovered the passport 
of Satam al sukami one of the terrorists aboard American Airlines Flight 11, the first plane to hit the World Trade Center. Now, that report has, of course, famously been misinterpreted, passed on as urban legend, that it was Mohammed Atta's passport that had been found in the street in Manhattan. It was, in fact, as this ABC News report confirms and other research confirms, Satam al Sukemi's passport allegedly discovered in Manhattan. Now, that plane was the one that struck the North Tower. It struck head-on into the North Tower and right into the lift shaft central core of the building. So really, it's stretching it to believe that following such an impact, the passport of one of the hijackers could be found in the street. In fact, it's absolutely laughable. Here's the government through the FBI saying to you, well, we've found the passport of one of the hijackers. Yes, it is incredible, but that's us saying it. Cornering people into taking the government line on board. And there were many such psychological manipulations which were deliberately pitched. If you go and do research on on the construction of psychological operations and the use of uh, something called cognitive dissonance, the tactic is just to keep nudging people into a state of denial and or fear. So you nudge them into it using the coup album cover. You nudge them into it using the claim you've found a hijacker's passport, a, a frankly incredible claim. Either deal with the reality that the government has the effrontery to lie to you in such a blatant way about having found a passport or has the effrontery to say to you hey we're we're running a coup either deal with that or else don't deal with it and end up being psychologically intimidated so we're dealing with stuff now particularly five years later because the trance has ended the trance created by that 9-11 event has ended all of this is following the dynamics of a grief process and it has a similar dynamic to a personal grief, this national grief or social grief as a result of 9-11 and the psychological shock which it inflicted on people. But they are out of the trance now. Five years afterwards, it's taken that five years, people are clearly catching on at this stage. Now, the establishment elite believe they can manage that rebound effect from the Bush administration and engage into a soft landing in an orange or velvet revolution in the United States. But I think the awakening is going deeper than that. And that's why it's so timely now to, in many ways, begin the real hard-nosed investigation of 9-11, the one which dismisses the useless froth which has been put out by the CIA itself and focuses on the core issues of 9-11, which indicate it was an inside job. And that's why the 9-11 9-11 investigation, 3-I investigation, the international independent investigation of 9-11 was launched on breakfornews.com because it's time to compile real data and that investigation is continuing. I'd like to thank all of those who have participated and are continuing to participate in that investigation and will be detailing some of the findings of that investigation in the course of this series. And uh, I really would recommend that you read the TRIA investigation, the discussion section, the analysis and the investigation section, because uh, there have been some tremendous contributions by forum members in there. And it's a terrific resource. And we're continuing that analysis. In many cases, that's detailed, complex and involves a lot of insider terminology and insider understanding. And as that process continues in the TRIA investigation, What I hope to do is approach it from the other end, not from the complexity of the nitty-gritty of seasoned 9-11 researchers, but to present this in an accessible format to those who are deeply suspicious, perhaps, but have yet to find a convincing argument that goes to the heart of the matter and that is relatively straightforward. So, as I say, I'll be going through reporting on the contents of the forum there, but approaching it in this way, which I hope is an accessible way. And uh, also over the next few days, we'll be producing a summary document of that first phase of our preliminary investigation of 9-11. And we'll be updating that then with audio and further research material on a monthly basis, just summarising our progress as we go along. Now, uh, the quality of posting, as I say, in the forum has been terrific. And that's a tribute to the resilience of the 9-11 truth movement, because um, 
they were supposed to have been disillusioned by now as I posted in uh, a posting on WAG News back in August the 5th of last year the long term idea was to have a whole host of investigators and activist leaders take each other out and thus run the movement into the ground well that's ongoing that did happen and uh, people have seen that and they have been disillusioned with the quality of 9-11 leadership and researchers etc that they have but they haven't become disillusioned with the issue and I think over the next year they will shrug off that CIA fake leadership and they will continue their investigations older and wiser in the process. You see, there's something rather unexpected happening, something they certainly didn't expect. They expected to be able to play political ping pong with the peasants as usual. But what's actually happening is an extraordinary awakening process is taking place, especially among those of us who have been with this issue and close to all these issues over the last five years. We are, in many ways, like those first responders at the World Trade Center site, picking through the debris of our own lives, which have been changed irrevocably by the last five years. In terms of our attitude, understanding of the world, and what's going on in it, we are, quite simply, not the same people we were five years ago. They have thrown everything they've got at us over that five years, and yet now, at the end of that time, we're not getting more and more confused. We're getting better and better informed. We've moved beyond their ping-pong political games. We understand their psychological games. And we're taking all this to the next level. And that process, while it's at its most acute in those of us closest to the cold face of resistance to the agenda that's been going on, it is rippling out into the general population. And uh, that, folks, should make for a very interesting next five years although we're probably getting ahead of ourselves a bit. What about the next five days? That should be interesting too. I'll be back in a couple of days with the next update in this series. And uh, drawing on the information in the 9-11-3i investigation, we'll be filtering through to the essential arguments that prove that 9-11 was an inside job. And uh, don't worry that we're small in number, by the way. That's exactly how it should be. The new politics is not the impersonal politics of mass politics, but the personal politics of this new communications medium, the internet. We've uh, got some extraordinary but ordinary people posting on the forum, visiting the website and listening to Break for News. We're not into the big names, the big games and the big egos, and we'll also have some extraordinary but ordinary guests on the show in the months ahead, and I hope you'll join us for that and join me for the next edition in a couple of days. Let's go out with something that's very personal. This is the incredible Snow Patrol and a live version of Chasing Cars. Okay, thanks for your support and thanks to those who have helped us out with a few books. There is a PayPal icon on the homepage of Break for News if you'd like to do that also. I will be back shortly with more and I do hope that you can join me for that. But in the meantime, for Break for News.